Okay, so hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. I hope you're as excited as we are for this interactive webinar on the six principles of regenerative agriculture as part of a Horizon 2020 project called AgriCapture CO2. I am Daisy Wood, a technical officer at LEAF and also one of the AgriCapture CO2 leads. Also with us this afternoon from LEAF is Claire, Harriet and Chloe who are helping with the project and we'll be talking a bit later on. So just to give you an agenda for this afternoon, we're going to kick off the webinar by giving a little bit of insight into LEAF and our mission and the AgriCapture CO2 project. We will then dive into LEAF's understanding of regenerative agriculture before going on to look at the six core principles of regenerative agriculture, explaining them and looking at the potential barriers to implementation after that, we're going to hear from our guest speaker, Rosie Davis, who is a land agent at Courtine Hall Estate. She is going to talk about how the estate implements regenerative farming and discuss the barriers they have overcome. Before and after Rosie speaks, we will run a few Slido polls. This will provide you with the opportunity to consider the importance of each principle on your farm and determine what the barriers may be to implementing the six principles. So now you know what the gender will be for this afternoon. Roll your shoulders, relax, and without further ado, I'll pass you on to Claire to introduce Leaf. Thank you so much, Daisy, and lovely to see you all. Thank you all for joining us today. So just a little bit about LEAF. Um, we, LEAF stands for Linking Environment and Farming, and we are a leading charitable organisation helping to deliver more sustainable food and farming. We're a membership based charity and we help farmers and a variety of stakeholders to improve their sustainability credentials around those aspects of integrated farm management in the wheel that you can see on the right hand there. Our mission is to see a global food and farming system that delivers climate positive action, builds resilience and supports health, diversity and the enrichment of our food, farms, the environment and wider society. And we're doing this by promoting integrated approaches, regenerative approaches, nature-based solutions, and where possible delivering productivity and prosperity among farmers through an approach that enriches the environment. But this is information that I'm sure you're all very aware of. We work towards achieving these visions and missions through that integrated farm management approach. Um, and, it, it, and we base everything that we deliver at LEAF upon, upon that. Integrated farm management uh, it involves all the aspects on your farm from planning and, uh, and um, uh, your, your business related side of your, um, of your uh, farm, all the way through to engaging society and then everything in between, whether that's soil management and fertility, whether it might be animal husbandry if you've got livestock, water management and not forgetting landscape and nature conservation. It is a site specific approach and uh, it, it is whole farm. What we mean by site specific is, we know that every single farm, every single business is unique, and therefore you can apply integrated farm management in a very unique way on your farm. So no two plans will be the same, for example, no two approaches will be the same. And it's a whole farm approach because obviously we have to encourage that mindset that you're thinking about all of these things across everything that you do when you're farming, as opposed to over concentrating on one aspect or another and then seeing unintended consequences. The wheels are a really good way to get across the message that farming is about your economic performance and your social health as much as it is about your about environmental quality. And each section of the wheel helps you to deliver a different aspect, whether that's regenerative practices or circular agriculture or whatever those philosoph philosophies or preferences are that you would like to follow. And all of these are achieved with that minimum negative environmental impact whilst encouraging biodiversity. Our saying at LEAF is that you can't be green if you're in the red. And it is absolutely critical that we are mindful of the economic resilience of your businesses too. But actually when you follow that integrated farm management approach, you should be able to see the economic benefits as much as you can see the other benefits too. We need to build resilience in, and, and robustness within our farming supply chain, our, our food supply chains and our farming businesses and beyond. And we, we know that we need to, yeah, we need to plan for the future. 
So with that, I'm delighted to hand over to Harriet, who is now going to introduce you a little bit more to the AgriCapture project. Great, thank you, Claire. So my name is Harriet, I'm a technical coordinator at LEAF, and we are delighted to be discussing AgriCapture CO2 with you all today. And so in the next few minutes, I will guide you through the fundamental aspects of the project. So AgriCapture stands as a collaborative endeavour uniting farmers, researchers and farming organisations with the ultimate goal being to champion regenerative agriculture as a solution to mitigating climate change, whilst also providing agronomic and economic solutions for farmers. So the project recognises that climate change is a growing threat and farmers are on the front line. Farmers therefore need to adapt to fast changing weather patterns whilst contributing to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So this project and its partners believe that by adopting regenerative practices, farmers can help solve the climate crisis whilst improving their resilience and boosting their profit margins. So within the project, there are two key aims. So the first is to develop an innovative, robust and scalable solution to measure carbon capture in soil. And secondly, we are actively engaging with farmers and other stakeholders through the European regenerative agriculture community. And so this community serves as a platform for facilitating knowledge exchange regarding regen practices and also technologies. And so a link to this community should have just been shared in the chat if anybody would like further information on that. So as I mentioned before, the community encompasses a range of activities, including access to reference materials, participation in regen webinars, and also on-farm visits. And so by recognizing the significance of collaboration and also knowledge sharing, the project really ensures active involvement and interaction with farmers and wider stakeholders. So to achieve these goals, the project focuses on developing a comprehensive range of services centered around four key themes, as you can see here. So these themes include exploring regen practices, developing support and advisory services for regen agriculture, validating these services and practices within the field, and then ultimately quantifying and developing the accuracy of measuring soil carbon capture. So I'm just going to pass on now to Daisy, who will talk you through what regenerative agriculture is. Thank you very much, Harriet. So now that you know a little bit more about LEAF and about AgriCapture CO2, let's talk about what they both understand regenerative agriculture to be. Regenerative agriculture is a set of farming management principles which aim to put soil health and the wider environment at the centre of agricultural practice. It is not a fixed or an absolute model, but rather a principle of how to farm. The overall ambition of this agricultural technique works to shift thinking from being purely extractive and linear towards establishing and understanding natural cycles of regeneration. It is a conservation and rehabilitation approach to food and farming systems, which supports productive and sustainable farming. It recognises that farms are part of a larger ecosystem and that agricultural activities must not just withdraw from this wider system, but also feed into it. Regenerative practices typically employ techniques that promote efficient use of natural resources with focus on building soil health, increasing biodiversity and reducing carbon emissions. So that's a very quick overview of regenerative agriculture, but I'm now going to pass you over to my colleague, Chloe, who will start off by explaining a few of, uh, well, each of the six principles in more detail. Hello all, um, thank you again for attending today's workshop. My name's Chloe, I am a technical officer at LEAF, and as Daisy mentioned, I'm working alongside her on the AgriCapture CO2 project. Daisy and I are going to explain each of the six principles principles of regenerative agriculture and discuss a little bit about what they entail. So, as you may have guessed by the title of the workshop, uh, there are six core principles to regenerative agriculture seen here on this infographic. These principles dominate regenerative farming and can help farmers on their way to becoming more regenerative in their agricultural practices. 
These principles support the integrated farm management approach that Claire mentioned earlier, and as such, build the foundation of the work that LEAF does day to day. So, the first principle is context, which is a relatively new addition to the sort of principles of regenerative agriculture. Um, this principle recognises the importance and individuality of each farm scenario. So as we all know, no two farms are the same, uh, so context is, is an essential piece of the puzzle. Each farm has differing soil, crop or livestock types, as well as differing climates, funding and skills. So understanding the context of your farm means regenerative agricultural practices can be implemented in line with individual farm operations. A farmer practicing this principle can set objectives and monitor their results to quantify and de demonstrate individual, unique, regenerative outcomes which are suited to their land. So context is the first principle. Thank you. Um, context is the first principle to discuss because it is critical for the implementation of the other five main principles of regenerative farming. Simply copying another farm's practices and expecting the, the same outcomes probably won't work on different land. Regenerative practices must be personalised and site-specific site in order to get the required outcomes. This principle is closely linked to LEAF's organisation and planning section of the integrated farm management approach. So acknowledging the conditions and capabilities of each farm or integrating regenerative principles is vital to an integrated farm approach. It may be difficult to apply context to farm systems, particularly for niche types of farming in which regenerative agriculture is not what is widely practiced, for example, horticulture. However, through the integrated farm management approach and LEAF's guidance, all types of farms can start their regenerative transition by recognizing where they can change their practices unique to their own context. A lot of farmers may already be practicing some of the following principles principles of regenerative agriculture um, that are site specific to them without even realizing. For example, uh, you may already be practicing minimum tillage because your soils are already fine, not necessarily thinking about it in a regenerative context. If you would like to learn more about integrated farm management as a whole, there is a link to our, our website uh, page going into the tab now. So principle two uh, is minimizing soil disturbance. This means avoiding farming practices that interrupt natural soil processes, including physical, chemical, and biological alterations. Physical soil disturbance refers to acts that physically disrupt the ground, such as tillage or grazing. Uh, disturbing the soil in this way can compromise the biological integrity of the ecosystem within the soil. Chemical disturbance includes the application of pesticides and fertilizers that harm microbes within the eco soil ecosystem. And lastly, biological disturbance refers to disturbing the soil ecosystem um, and can occur due to things like lack of living roots or microbes in the soil. Improving and regenerating soil is at the heart of regenerative agriculture. Therefore, understanding and applying the principle of reduced soil disturbance, principle two, is really essential. Reducing the soil disturbance helps restore soil health, uh, which can be beneficial for all of the other principles of regenerative agriculture that we're going to discuss. And reducing disturbances of all types, so biological, um, physical and chemical, helps to improve the performance, health and long-term sustainability of your land. To work towards this principle, farmers can use LEAF's soil and fertility section of the integrated farm management wheel that we saw earlier, um, or the Simply Sustainable Soils booklet, which will be added to the chat now. Um, the Simply Sustainable Soils booklet gives you six steps to help improve the performance, health, and long-term sustainability of your soil. Tillage and pesticide applications have been adopted by farmers for years due to their ability to consistently encourage uniform crop establishment, even in bad weather. 
Therefore, practicing no tillage or minimum tillage and, and reducing pesticide applications can be difficult to implement um, and may decrease short term yield, particularly if soils are already damaged from years of intrusive farming. In, intrusive farming. Despite this, um, you can begin to minimise soil disturbance gradually. Uh, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing approach on, on across the entire sort of landscape. Um, and in the long term, reducing soil disturbance can significantly improve soil health and structure to a point where tillage and soil disturbance isn't necessarily required for uniform crop establishment. Okay, so I'm going to take us on to the third principle of regenerative agriculture, which is diversity. In a natural ecosystem, it is very uncommon to see monocultures. However, modern agriculture heavily relies on these because they're often more simple to manage. This principle highlights the importance of maximizing community diversity to promote healthy, functional ecosystems. Increasing crop and community diversity often also decreases the occurrence and damage of pests and diseases, so has multiple benefits. We often see with greater above ground diversity, there is greater there is increased below ground diversity, improving soil health, soil food webs and encouraging more diverse nutrient cycles. Crop diversity can be increased in many ways. The diversity of the actual cash, cash crop can be increased through companion cropping or intercropping. Cover cropping also increases diversity within an arable rotation between cash crops. Diversity can be increased within a livestock scenario by implementing strategies such as incorporating a variety of grazing species within a pasture. Financial flexibility can often be a barrier to engaging with regenerative agriculture, especially this principle, diversity, as it can involve buying more seeds for cover cropping or buying more costly livestock to diversify your grazing stock. It can also be difficult to implement diversity if you do not quite understand which crop species grow well together. Um, and there are, there are a variety of resources to support you on this journey, such as the Leaf Simply Sustainable series, we've mentioned the Soil Simply Sustainable, and other information which you can find on the resources tab of our website, if that's helpful. Although sometimes this principle can require an initial investment of time or money, Overall, improved diversity increases ecological functionality and helps build resilience at both a farm and field level. The fourth principle is protecting the soil surface. Keeping the soil covered has many benefits, including protecting the soil from erosion caused by heavy rain and wind or preventing the soil from drying out in drought. Keeping the soil covered can be achieved in a number of different ways, from creating a mat of dead plant material from crop residue, such as straw, or by sowing a cover crop to protect the soil. Covering the surface of the soil not only protects the soil, but the organisms living within it against weathering and erosion. An effective way to implement this principle is through overwinter cover cropping alongside judicious main crop and cover crop management. Incorporating cover crops, as previously mentioned, also increases the overall diversity of the farm and aids progress within the diversity principle. Again, depending on your farm context, implementing this principle may require financial and time investment, such as buying extra seeds or spending time planning and planting the cover crop. However, this effort usually reaps rewards in the long term by protecting the soil, reducing erosion and increasing soil nutrients. Over to you, Chloe. So principle five, maintaining living roots. Um, so this refers to maintaining living roots within the soil and relates very closely to principle two, which I spoke about a moment ago, which was minimizing soil disturbance. This is because by maintaining the living roots within the soil, you are reducing biological soil disturbance. So maintaining living roots in the soil is vital for feeding the organisms at the bottom of the soil food web. Plant um, and soil biology have, very, have a very close relationship. 
Living plants uh, obviously photosynthesize energy from the sun into chemically bound energy, which is then transferred into the plant root system and then the soil ecosystem, which is where it's stored. Without the presence of living roots, soil continues to metabolize organic matter, which results in carbon dioxide, uh, CO2, being released into the atmosphere. Therefore, maintaining living roots is vital to lowering carbon emissions on farm. In addition to this, roots allow plants to allow plant to plant and plant to soil communication. So by maintaining living roots in the soil, um, this can positively influence the actions of the soil microbe ecosystem. This can result in increased soil health, including enhanced nutrient supply, uh, improved stress tolerance and increased nitrogen fixation. Alongside connecting the plants and soil, this root system allows for communication between plants about things like infestation. Um, so maintaining living roots actually also acts as a natural pest management system. So the final principle, principle six, is uh, livestock integration. The inclusion of livestock in rotations, whether it be arable rotations or mob grazing, delivers many benefits to the soil. These benefits can include improved soil structure, plant diversity and microbial diversity, as well as fertilizing the soil with nutrients in livestock dung. High impact mob grazing is often associated with the principle of livestock in integration. Uh, mob grazing involves a short disturbance through grazing followed by long recovery periods. When utilizing livestock for soil health, Timing, frequency, intensity, grazing time and rest duration should be managed very carefully. Livestock can be included in arable rotations through the use of things like grazable cover crops between arable crops. Depending on the key element of context, principle one we discussed earlier, implementing regenerative livestock management may be simple or challenging. Where livestock cannot be integrated into a farming system easily, this principle can still be implemented by using local manure and slurry as an organic source of nutrients in a circular system. Regenerative practices really can be flexible and site specific. So we have now gone through the six principles of regenerative agriculture. By implementing these principles, farmers can use regenerative agricultural practices to enhance their soil health, carbon sequestration, and climate resilience. Understanding the benefits and importance of each of these principles will ensure that regenerative agricultural practices and outcomes are achieved on your land. I will now hand over to Claire, uh, who is going to, I think Daisy actually is going to run through some interactive questions on Slido before Claire introduces our guest speaker. Yes, so um, before we hear from our guest speaker, I would like you all to do a quick poll on the six principles of regenerative agriculture to gather your thoughts. We are then going to do another poll afterwards once we have heard from Rosie. So on the chat, a link to Slido will be shared. Um, if this does not work, then type in slido.com onto into Google um, and Harriet in a minute will share the Slido. There we go. So if you type in slido.com and you can insert those numbers. If not, then click on the, the Slido link that we shared in the chat. So I can see is that one person so far is on the, the Slido? So we'll give you, ah, here we go. Everyone's joining. We'll give you a few minutes just to hop onto the Slido. And I believe you should be able to um, start answering the first question whenever you're ready. Please type into the, into the Zoom chat if this is not the case. We're having technical difficulties. There we go. So we can see some answers coming through. Um, we'll give you maybe 30 more seconds. 
maybe a few less than that. Got to keep it keep it quick and snappy. Lovely. So we can see that that most people think that regenerative having a regenerative framework or a plan is important. Uh, Harriet, let's pop on to the next the next question. So why do you think enhancing diversity to build resilience is important? So you can use information from the talk that you've just heard or from your own thinking. Um, and your answer should start to pop up on the screen. Don't think too hard about this. Just say whatever comes to your mind, um, whatever you think. Um, what, why you think it's important doesn't matter if anyone else thinks it or not fabulous look at all this so the i think the bigger the word the more people have um also said a similar thing go on think of some more we'll give you a few more few more seconds working with nature pest control sustainability and climate change the big ones Lovely. Five more seconds, counting down. Fabulous. Sorry, we're going to pop on to the next question now. Um, but really, really thank you for engaging with that question. So do you think minimising soil disturbance will improve resilience um, within your farming business? You can see some undecided there, which is fair enough. We've only just started hearing about it, perhaps. Um, and it's a difficult thing to, to try and negotiate, difficult to implement. Fab, okay. But the majority do think that it will improve resilience. I think it's worth noting there as well, Daisy, if I can just say, yeah. I, think it's, it's, I think that's a really balanced view because in, in many cases, you could argue that we don't have enough evidence yet to demonstrate that these kinds of practices and principles are making the changes that we're hoping they're making. So I think actually I'm not surprised to see undecided quite high here on the basis that it is going to take a few years for us to really um, evidence some of the kind of changes that we're making and kind of things we're throwing out there and hoping hoping that they'll, they'll make the difference. But but the evidence isn't isn't necessarily there. Yeah, really important point. Thank you. So we'll pop on to the next question. Do you feel that an integrated farm management approach that we've been talking about throughout this, this webinar can help farmers achieve regenerative outcomes? Now be be honest here. Um, that's what we're looking for. Great. A few more, a few more moments for those of you who haven't quite put it into the chat yet. Okay. Um I believe that might be might have been the last question for this section. Is that correct, Harriet? Yeah, that's the last question. Fab. So I will now, if we go back, um, actually, yeah. So so if we can unshare the screen, and then I'll introduce you to Rosie Davis from Courtine Hall Estate, who is going to talk to us about um, her experience of implementing the six principles of regenerative agriculture. So go for it, Rosie, if you can share your screen. And we can see that perfectly. And you can hear me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> hi, so um, yeah, I'm Rosie Davis. I am assistant agent at Corton Hall Estate. Um, so I help manage the farming business um, as well as other aspects of the estate business as a whole. Um, Corton Hall Estate is a thousand hectare estate in Northamptonshire, and we have another thousand hectares in Norfolk. Uh, we are arable, poultry, beef, and stewardship. Um, and as a business, we very much consider stewardship to be one of our four types of farming. Um, in Norfolk, actually, we also have a flock of rare breed sheep that are relatively new additions that we're growing. Um, today I'll be speaking mainly about our Northamptonshire farm, but I will mention our farm in Norfolk when I speak about livestock. 
Uh, so our soils in Northamptonshire are mainly hand slope clay, so we are on heavier land. Um, and as mentioned previously in this talk, context and situation of each farm is really important when looking at adopting new methods and principles for any kind of farming, but also for regen agriculture. Um, one of the main difficulties that we have as a farm is that our land can become compacted quite easily. Um, and once it has become compacted, we have found that cover crops don't always do enough to restructure the soil. So we actually occasionally do need to shallow cultivate the land um, to ensure that it remains in the best health that it can. We don't do this regularly. And when we do it, we do assess all the soils beforehand to ensure that we only carry it out in fields that need it. Um, but we don't see regen farming as strictly no cultivation. It's just minimizing it and only using it when we absolutely need to. Um, we try and work with the soil to get the best crop and maintain the soil health as much as possible. Um, we accept that it is not a um, it's not an overnight change and it's a journey rather than um, an overnight change. Um, so in Northamptonshire, we began our regenerative journey, shall we say, over 10 years ago. Um, and since then, we have been through a lot of changes. It's not kind of been a steep incline. It's been kind of stepped, I would say. Um, we purchased some big kit, which you can see in the photos, um, for controlled traffic farming, which allowed us to get our infield tracking down by a significant amount, um, around about 40%, I think. Um, the big kit that I mentioned was a 12 meter controlled traffic system with a 36 meter sprayer boom. The issue we had with this big kit was the fact that our costs, our fixed costs per acre were huge. So it wasn't leading, as Claire said earlier, to a sustainable business financially for us. Um, so in 2020, we actually moved away from farming in hand and we're now contract farmed. So we now no longer use the big kit or a controlled traffic system, but we do try and minimise our tracking across the fields as much as possible on our acreage. Um, as mentioned previously, since we changed to contract farming, we have um, cultivated shallowly not ploughed, just kind of moved, the, tickled the soil on the top. Um, and that was only over some of the land. Um, we are also in an area of heavy black grass burden. So cultivations can pose a difficulty in that regard um, because we can bring, we can end up bringing dormant seeds back to the surface. Um, so for us, that's just another reason to only cultivate when we really need to. Um, otherwise we'll, make a problem even worse than we need to. Um, now we've carried out these cultivations over the last several years, the soils are less compacted um, than they were before. Um, and as a result, we are looking to utilize cover crops in a new way in certain areas of slightly lighter land where these can help maintain the soil structure as well as putting nitrogen back into the soils and maintaining green cover all year as mentioned previously. Uh, in the past and moving forward, we are trialing an understory of white clover, uh, which you can see in that photo on the left. This gives us a continuous green cover all year round, ensuring that there's no soil leaching or nutrient runoff. It also gives us a con constant root structure as well as obviously the nutrient benefits that it puts back into the soil. So it releases nitrogen into the soil and therefore lowers our reliance on artificial fertilizer, um, which reduces our number of passes over the fields. So also reduces our cost um, in terms of fuel use and fertilizer cost. Um, again, black grass has not been our friend in terms of this because it's very difficult to control if you do get a black grass issue where you do have an understory. Um, the photo on the right, uh, this was in my first year, first week of work, and the whole team went out roguing in the field with the worst black grass burden. Um, 
you also obviously with an understory can't cultivate so it doesn't work for all farms um and even across our farm it may not work in certain areas so again that goes back to the context and the situation of each um farm and the seed is not cheap um so you have to know that it will kind of work for you before you um spend a lot of money on seed uh, I should mention that in the past, one of our best weapons against black grass has been spring cropping, um, which has worked well for us because we can allow a bit of growth and then um, spray it off before drilling the crop. Um, at Corton Hall, we take pride in the fact that we really work on our soil health and getting the best out of the soil type that we have. As I mentioned, we are mainly on heavy hand slope clay. However, we do also have some lighter lands. Um, the two photos to the left of the screen show the variety of different soils. These were actually taken on the same day. Um, the one on the furthest left obviously being very dry. Um, and the dogs tried to get in the one on, in the middle, which um, they didn't try and get in the dry one, of course. Um, we are currently part of a European project looking at uh, climate neutral farming. And one of the biggest factors in this is looking at the different soil types and understanding them so that we can work with them rather than kind of constantly battling against them and trying to make them something they're not. Um, and also understanding what we can do to help improve them without us interfering unnecessarily. I think it's a really key thing in terms of regen agriculture and something that farmers really need to think about before starting their journey to make sure that whatever they're being, whatever they're trialing works or is more likely to work on their soil type. We are also as a business keen to learn more about carbon and carbon capture in the soil. Um, so we work alongside our agronomists Indigro who carry out a survey each year which involves a carbon calculator. Um, and then there's a conference to run through the results with all the other farmers who have taken part. So we can kind of benchmark ourselves against some of their other farmers um, and see where we can make improvements to maximize soil organic matter. Um, they give us the results on a per hectare and a per ton basis. So you can, it's easy to compare um, your kind of results so we can compare the last three years results as well. Um, it's now in its third year and has grown from 14 farms participating to over 60 last year. So the more farms that take part, obviously the more useful it is. Um, I would say the main takeaway from it for us has been the nitrogen use efficiency curve, um, showing that as a general rule, any nitrogen over a certain amount per hectare will not make a significant difference to your yield. So you're basically spending money to an in increasing your your farm's carbon footprint without actually getting enough benefit from what you're putting onto the ground. Um, collaboration and knowledge sharing was another thing that Chloe mentioned um, as a principle. And I think it's really important when starting off with anything new in farming, um, as well as learning from other people who might have trialed things firsthand. Obviously though, you kind of have to put it back into context of your own farm. Um, we are part of a, of a cluster farm. Um, so we've had various talks from people who are experts in things like soils, compost, and even dung beetles, um, which have all been really useful. And we've learned a lot from every talk that we've had. Um, as part of our cluster farm, we also carry out water testing in ditches and streams that run through the farm, um, which makes sure that nothing is getting into the watercourse that shouldn't. Um, and that kind of uh, backs up the, our encouragement to kind of be very conscious about when we spray, how much we're spraying. Um, so I put in a photo of one of our team water testing in the ditch. Um, livestock integration being another principle is something that we really aspire to in Northamptonshire. Um, however, I will speak a bit in um, in a bit about our stewardship agreement, which has kind of um, made that difficult for now. But in the long term, we would love to get livestock integrated into the system. 
Um, but in Norfolk, we are working alongside a local shepherd, creating a court and hall herd of rare breed sheep, including Llanwenogs, which are in the top right. Um, in uh, So we're also hoping to enter into a mid-tier countryside stewardship agreement over in Norfolk, um, which would see cover crops established and then the herd of sheep would then graze them. Um, so yeah, it's something we're really keen to learn more about. We have actually um, trialed it in Northamptonshire, but the land in Norfolk lends itself slightly more because it's lighter land. Um, when we trialed it in Northamptonshire, the sheep were not moved on quick enough. And that combined with a wet season meant we were left with ground that was more compacted than beforehand, as Chloe also mentioned. Um, however, when we did trial it, it was at the start of our regenerative journey. So the soils would have been in a different heart back then. Um, we have had some people suggest that if we were to try it now with our improved soils, we would get a very different result. Um, I suppose barrier wise to livestock integration is um, the cost. Fencing our arable fields without any kind of grant would be incredibly expensive, but there are um, some good grants around for things like this, um, which do make it more feasible. Um, and yeah, so in January 2022, we entered into a higher tier stewardship scheme, which saw our cropping rotation change significantly. Um, as I've mentioned, black grass being an issue across the farm, we <coughs> worked with Natural England, as well as our agronomists, to work out the best solution for this. Um, and as a result, we're now putting half the farm down to AB15 leguminous fallow for two years and then flipping it over. The idea is that you can top the AB15. So this year we've topped it five times and you kind of start higher and work the way down so that you can um, top the heads of the black grass off um, before they drop the seeds. Um, and the other half of the farm is just in the normal um, arable winter wheat and then possibly a second wheat. Um, when changing over in next year from AB15 back into arable, when we flip it over, our intention is to disc drill the wheat into the AB15, which will have then been sprayed off. But we will need to carry out visual soil assessments to ensure that the soil is in the right heart to take it. Um, if we were able to do it, then we would also only be disturbing the very top level of soil. So hopefully not bringing uh, dormant black grass seeds back to the surface. Um, We've also been trialing catch crops, um, which we've been trialing elsewhere on the farm because it doesn't work in the AB15 wheat rotation because the gap between them is not big enough. Um, but we're trialing a mustard catch crop in an area that's not within the higher tier scheme. The difficulties uh, with this is that if you're baling the straw from the crop before, you would need to get it off the field pretty quickly. Um, and if you have a dry summer, you may struggle to establish it. Um, if you have to cultivate to establish a catch crop, it then also may create a bigger black grass issue. Um, and if that's the case, your only choice is to kind of wait and hope that the mustard outcompetes the black grass and shades it out and kills it. Um, catch crops are difficult due to their timing. Um, and we take the view that they would need to kind of pay their way to make it worth establishing them in the first place. Um, going back to our stewardship scheme, we've put in a lot of wildflower margins and infield grass strips. And the infield grass strips will help with any erosion we experience um, and prevent any leaching into the watercourses. Um, and the wildflower margins mean that we've taken areas of fields that were less productive out of the arable rotation and created habitat and food for wildlife. Um, the insects you can see and hear in these margins at the moment really shows the difference that they're making. Um, the photo on the right being one that I walked past the other day and I had to stop and take a video <laughs> um, because it was so loud. Um, 
we haven't used any insecticides on the farm for over five years and we believe that these margins help with this as they promote the um the insects that prey on the kind of aphids and any other pests within the fields um whereas when you use insecticides obviously you can often destroy these beneficial insects as well uh, the photo on the left shows a field of wood pasture. <clears throat> so we've just taken two fields out of arable production and put them back into parkland through this wood pasture creation option. Um, we've also planted lots of trees within these fields um, and eventually the cattle will be grazing in there. Um, the whole stewardship scheme has been designed to create wildlife corridors so that wildlife can travel across the farm without having to go into the arable fields. Um, and I do believe that stewardship schemes are a great way to kind of start uh, a regenerative farming journey um, because it gives you financial help to take unproductive areas of land and use these for good. Um, there are so many options and it can work alongside livestock integration as well, as we're doing in Norfolk. Um, so, yeah, I think in conclusion, regenerative farming can mean different things to different people and what works for one farm may not work for another. The key things are to understand your soils and work with these as well as the weather, because it could be that direct drilling may work one year, but the next year the weather may be completely different and it might not work um, and it also depends completely on the state of the soils as well the other key thing that i think is very important is collaboration and knowledge sharing um, you can learn so much from other farmers um even though what works for them might not work for you and vice versa but um i just think the more you can learn the better and that's me thank you so much rosie that was absolutely fascinating i'm sure the audience will agree brilliant to hear the int the introduction of some rare breeds to uh, to your business i think you brought out some really key points there that are worth just reinforcing it's about testing and trialing a lot of the time and i think that's really good to know you know for, for us to understand that there aren't necessarily right answers and what works on one farm might not work on another um it's brilliant, therefore, that you're part of a cluster because you've got that knowledge exchange um, uh, opportunity. Because a lot of what we're doing here and a lot of what farming is, is, is risk management and actually just being able to bounce your ideas off somebody else um, and, and other farmers in your, in your geographical location or wider than that can be really, really helpful to you know, give you the courage perhaps to, to take a risk or to learn from other people's um, uh risk risk management um it's not always straightforward as you said and and sometimes you don't get the results that you hoped for and it can be different frustratingly it could be different from year to year you know you apply something and, and and it's not always straightforward moving on from that point either so you know there is no exact science here and i think that's the key message but but sharing as much as we can with each other um, and uh, learning how to take those risks with each other. And perhaps like you say, a really great idea there in terms of accessing grants and what's, how stewardship can help in this space. Because I know that for a great number of farmers wanting to look at and apply regenerative principles, cost can be a barrier or the perception of the cost or the concern that there will be cost. Um, and perhaps you're also considering not only the cost of, of those of, the, of that transition, but also how it might impact your bottom line if yields aren't there for the next couple of years as well. So, you know, we can't we can't have this discussion without talking about the economics and, and does it pay to be regenerative? And I think the answer is um, we're hopeful and we believe it does in the long term. But actually, there might be a transition period. So those grants um and that knowledge exchange can be a really helpful support system while while you're making where you get on that transition so huge thank you again rosie that was just fascinating and yeah i think we're going to move on to uh, our second slido session now so exactly the same rules as before um and uh, you can see the qr code there we'd love to get your thoughts on well first of all if you can share what type of organization you are if you're happy to share that uh, I'll give a few moments for you to answer that first question or to or to even get into Slido, uh, actually. Um, uh, 
Brilliant. We might need to scroll down in a second, Harriet, so we can see some of those lower ones. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah. Good. That's we've got a really great cross section within the audience. So that's that's absolutely wonderful. And I think that again is an indication of how regenerative principles and the whole narrative around regenerative farming and agriculture and those regenerative outcomes are important to a great range of stakeholders. It's not just about farming, but it's about supply chains, it's about educators, it's about the other industry actors as well. So thank you for that. Can we move on to the next one, please, Harriet? Thank you. Where do you think a regenerative framework or plan, or sorry, why do you think a regenerative framework or plan is in farming is important? And I think this is probably another word cloud. Yeah, definitely future proofing, I think, is really important, kind of gazing onto the horizon and, and uh, trying to understand what your business might need to look like. Again, sustainability, that, that, that word keeps coming up. Progress, I really like that. It's about continuing, continuous improvement is the whole ethos behind integrative farm management. And, and it's not always about making big changes and grand gestures, actually, this is going to work out as a game of inches in terms of small changes will add up to larger Im greater impact in the long run. So I don't think we ever need to fear that we're not doing enough or that we've got a bit backwards this year or that our plans don't seem ambitious, en ambitious enough. I think plans need to be realistic, um, taking into consideration all those aspects of your business, including the economics. But actually, any small changes will add up. And we've got other great words in there. Um, yeah, we've got resilience again. Um, and I think the hot, yeah, I think a few of the words here have picked out that it, it is the importance of planning, taking a step back and just, you know, observing from it with, through a different lens, maybe than the everyday, everyday lens. So thank you, Harry. If we can move on, have we got another one? Why do you think enhancing diversity to build resilience is important? So so what is it about diversity that's important to a sustainable farming system, food and farming system? Yeah. A lot of these words that are coming up are exactly pinpointing that risk or the challenge we have right now in terms of the inability to predict, to forecast the weather, the climate, all sorts of different things there's a huge amount of complexity out there that, you know, put a farm into a test tube and I'm sure that you could do, you know, incredible things year after year, but actually we don't exist in a test tube. And it's that, that environment, that's that situation, that context that farming is sitting in is really quite pressured. Again, the word risk is coming up. Absolutely. Biodiversity, really, really critical. Fantastic. Thank you, Harriet. Um, got another? Brilliant. Do you think minimising soil disturbance will improve resilience? Yeah, and again, I think this is a fair assessment and a really good indication, perhaps a good barometer of, of the feeling in, in, the, in the sector where we probably still don't have enough evidence yet to actually say, yes, this is the right thing to do. We've got a feeling um, we 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 kind of yeah, we, we know that probably minimizing soil disturbances is, is probably the right thing to do where we can um, and that it should improve resilience. But I think this is a really good indication that um, we need to be building up the evidence in order for more farmers to be um, encouraged and, uh, and and have the confidence to, to make some of the changes, perhaps. Thank you very much. Harriet, is that the, oh, one, one more? Is it one more? I don't know. <laughs> do, you, do you feel that an integrated farm management approach can help farmers achieve regenerative outcomes? This is similar to one of the questions that we had earlier. We wanted to pose this again because we wondered whether, once we'd listened to Rosie and, and, uh, and um, 
uh, etc. It'd be it'd be good good to see whether it managed to convince any more people that uh, that an integrated approach might be the way forward. And if I remember rightly, from the first time that we did this, I think we have persuaded one or two more percent that that's an integrated farm management approach can help. So Rosie, I'm going to absolutely credit you for that. Well done. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, fantastic. What do you think is the main barrier to regenerative approaches? I think this is um, a really interesting question and we'd love to we'd love to know what you think. Is it the cost? Is it the uncertainty? Is it still yet to be proven? Lack of examples out there? Problems with accessing the information, lack of support, lack of time. Perhaps peer pressure. Sometimes peer pressure can be a good thing, but absolutely it can it can sometimes not be a, a bad thing. It can be an inhibitor as well. I think that's really, really important. But perhaps that first one that's getting lots of lots of agreement, that uncertainty, I think probably is made up of some of the ones below it as well as um you know it's it's really difficult to know what to do season to season sometimes month to month over this summer so um or week to week even so yeah i think that's really fair that um, there's a lot of uncertainty out there perhaps we need some more research perhaps we need to be sharing the stories more and the case studies more perhaps we need to hear more from people like rosie and Cortine hall and um, yeah, some of the things that have worked and not worked. And hopefully some of you today will have found that really helpful um, to hear to hear that that case study from Courtine Hall. Brilliant. Fantastic. So what is your key takeaway from this session? So, again, I think this is a word cloud. If you could. Give us your thoughts, that would be brilliant. And this is our, our final question. Ah, thank you. I've been saying that for the last 10 slides, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> Planning, yeah. Yes, the support, use the support or ask for the support. You know, organisations like LEAF are here to support, but we'd love to hear how we can do that better. So perhaps after this webinar, if any of you have got any thoughts about how you think we can support farmers and supply chains better in this space, whether it's more webinars, whether it's more events, whether it's uh, greater interaction, maybe it's more emails from me, because I know that you all love receiving your emails from me um, frequently. So what is it that, that perhaps organizations like LEAF and other NGOs perhaps could be doing to support? Or what could other areas in the industry, do you need more cluster groups? etc do we need more advisors out there how many advice how it'd be great to hear from you how how easy or difficult it might be to find an advisor that can help you that can support you and hold your hand during this transition yeah some really great questions there that, that we still need to answer um and perhaps sometimes it's about considering what the journey looks like. So perhaps it's not a, a, an overnight change to, to, to starting or stopping some things entirely on your farm or some practices entirely on your farm, but perhaps it's something that you phase in. Brilliant. That's, we've got some really great ideas there. Thank you so much. Um, just to let you all know, if you're not familiar with Sido, these do get encapsulated and and. and uh, stored for us so that we can go back afterwards and uh, and make sure that um, that your participation and your engagement has not been in vain and that we can actually use this to shape what we do moving forwards. Right, I think that would be a great place for me to stop talking now and pass back to Daisy. Thank you. Yes, fabulous. So thank you very much, everyone, for your input and your interaction with Slido. It's been really interesting and will be really helpful moving forwards. Um, so during your Slido poll, you've just each individually reflected on what you felt was important within this talk. Uh, we have key uh, two key take home messages that we'd love you to remember um, as you go about your days today and onwards. So context is an essential consideration if we are to apply regenerative principles to our land successfully. And also 
that knowledge exchange is essential to share learnings, demonstrate impacts and help others achieve regenerative outcomes. So please try to share your new learnings today and talk about them with your neighbours and your friends, cause debates because that is how change will come about um, and discussion will happen. So before we end the webinar today, I have one final thing to promote. So um, on the 27th of September, we are running a focus group. And in this group, we will be asking farmers to test out an online soil carbon monitoring tool, which can be used to collect, uh, which can be used for collecting, generating and reporting on agricultural field data, as well as regenerative practices and outcomes. The tool is in its trial period um, and we're doing it for AgriCapture CO2, so it's independent from LEAF as a product, uh, but it can be used for purposes including certifications, carbon credits, evidence of soil health, agricultural land markets and much more. Uh, we have limited spaces, so it's done on a first come first serve basis. Each participant will receive £100 as a thank you for taking part, so um, a great incentive, and it's being held at Stonely Park. If this sounds interesting to you, then please feel free to send me an email. My email address will be on the next slide, or click on the link, which hopefully my colleague will share in the chat now. Um, so thank you very much. That's all for today. We really appreciate your time and your interaction with Slido, and we hope you have a lovely afternoon. Thank you very much.